Hello, everyone. Nice to see you. Uh, as Emily said, my name is Margie Lehrman, and I am the CEO of the American Craft Spirits Association. I have a question for you all, and I'd like to see you raise your hand. How many of you have ever been to Disney World, Disneyland, Disney Europe? Anyone? Okay. How is that at all related? <laughs> You heard the title of this presentation. You're here because you want to know what is it about a sense of place. I think Disney has probably mastered what it is to create a visitor experience. So as we're going through this, and you listen to our first presenter, Jason, who's gonna be talking to you about what is a visitor experience? What are some of the parameters that you should be looking at? And then Tom Mooney speaking about, hmm, consumers coming into the tasting room, into the distillery, what does that mean? And then followed by Guillermo, who is going to be telling you about what happens when he brings the trade into his space. Before we get there, I just want to share a fact with you. The American Craft Spirits Association partnered with Park Street and the IWSR to create an economic data study for our industry. One had never previously been done looking only at craft spirits producers. Why is it important to get folks into your tasting room, into your own place? Well, for large producers in the United States, and we define large producers are those who are producing 100,000 proof gallons or more, up to um, actually 750,000 proof gallons, roughly 18% of total sales annually come from their, their place, right? Go to medium, that number goes up just a little bit, but look at that huge jump when you're looking at the small distilleries. Roughly 40% of their overall business comes from the distillery itself. Since I can't bring you all to the United States and introduce you to some of our member producers, we're gonna take a very quick tour. New York Distilling Company, annual visitors 15,000 per year. Um, is that notable? Absolutely. Brooklyn itself has 2.5 million visitors overall, but they have at least 15,000 come through. Backwards Distilling, Casper, Wyoming, 40,000 40, they estimate at the end of this year. Why is that particularly noteworthy? The entire state only has 500,000 people in it. How about Driftless Glen? Baraboo, Wisconsin. Has anyone ever heard of Baraboo, Wisconsin? Has anyone ever heard of the Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey Circus? Okay, started in Baraboo, Wisconsin. They have uh, a beautiful, beautiful restaurant facility. They get 54,000 coming to the restaurant alone. St. Augustine Distillery, Fountain of Youth, Florida. Annual visitors, 160,000 coming through. And then we move to something just a little bit smaller, Head Frame Spirits, Butte, Montana. They have told me that they get thousands of distillers. It is a natural hot spot if you come into the state. They do work very closely with tourism boards to make it happen. And then finally, Blom Brothers Distillery in Galena, Illinois. Anyone ever heard of Galena? Okay, little known fact, Ronald Reagan was actually born in Galena, Illinois. <laughs> Not connected with the distillery, however, they have a wonderful, wonderful program with their tourism office, bringing in over a million visitors to that particular city. The city itself, get this, only 3,000 residents, and yet a million people come into that city. So the question is, how do you make it happen? How do you make it work? How do you create that not only visitors experience, but then also translate that into having loyal customers. And the panel is going to tell you all how to do it. So at this point, I'd like to introduce Jason Dobson, Contagious. I'm Jason Dobson, Contagious. I'm business and creative director there. Just to give you a bit of background on Contagious, we're a design and experience agency based out of Edinburgh. 
Um, I spe we specialize in the drinks industry and have been doing that for around about 10 years now. Uh, we deliver brand strategy, brand development, brand communication, packaging, and visitor centers and brand homes. We've done over 40 uh, visitor experiences globally. That includes Angels Envy and Mictus in Louisville. We've done uh, Beef Eater and Haven's Gin in London and uh, Aberfeldy and Glen Goyne up in Scotland. What these uh, brands all have in common is they see their visitor experience as central to their brand. And I think what I'd like to start to do, start with is kind of ask a question. So what is the most amazing memory that you've ever had? Now at this point, I was going to put a slide up that spoke about, that it was a picture of me skydiving. Because that's the, that's the most amazing memory that I've ever had. Why is that? Because it's split not over just one hour or two hours. It was a series of events. The first part of that was being educated. 10, 15 people in a room, sat there for the day, being explained quite clearly how we were all going to die the next day. <laughs> next day, second day you're in there, you've then got the experience of the skydive. You've got the equipment, you're putting on, um, you're putting on the, the parachute. It's the, the feeling of anticipation, the feeling of nervousness, the fear. You're being walked out to a plane that is basically the size of a mini. You get in there with five or six other people, you go to 7,000 feet and you jump out. Or in my case, you get pushed out. For about five seconds, you've lost complete um, understanding of where you are and what you're doing. Three seconds later, you look up, the parachute opens, it is the most amazing feeling you get, you're alive. You land on the floor, you've got a smile on your face. If you look at the emotion that's encapsulated within that experience, and you think about how you can apply that same emotion and that same memory to create, I am now an advocate of parachute, and I don't, if you've not done it, I would tell you all to go and jump out of a plane. It's something you'll never, ever forget. I tell that story, I tell it here, I tell it to other people, they pass it on. So how can we then look at how we can put that into some context of providing key principles necessary to deliver kind of a meaningful consumer experience? So we'll break it down into five areas. So defining your brand, first define uh, your brand experience. Every interaction that you have with your brand is an opportunity to provide a great experience to the people that you want to come uh, to, your, to, to the visitor center. You need to decide what you are delivering. So when you understand what you stand for, you can then understand that what you, you have to deliver. You need to consider every step of the journey. So you're going to have your customer's attention, in some cases, for a very short amount of time. So you want to make sure that you define every single thing that you might do and do it the way you want to do it. You then need to identify the takeouts. So what are they going to leave with in their heads and their hands and actually in their hearts? And then finally, pinpoint the reasons why. So why do they want to engage with your brand? So I'm just going to go down through these in a little bit more detail. So if you look at defining your brand experience, so split these into four areas. So you need to understand who your target audience actually is. So don't think about age, think about attitude. Who, you know, what is the attitude of these people? What kind of experiences have they been to previously? Are they emotional? Are they educational? Are they physical? You need to articulate what your brand stands for. So often there's many reasons why somebody will be attracted to your brand and a lot of other reasons why they'll care. So in the very beginning, it's, you need to have some very good self-examination of your brand um, and define and be very clear about what it is that you want to, to, to share. Next is the delivery of a brand proposition to an audience with a specific purpose. So you should aspire for every single tangible part of your brand to be intrinsically tied into what you want to stand for. And then finally, you need to achieve what you need as a brand and a business. And this is closing the circle. This is achieving um, and creating advocates, which is then going to lead on from that point to sales. Second, you need to decide what you're delivering. So the example here um, that I'm showing is Angel's Envy. So the, the, the proposition for Angel's Envy was Lincoln Henderson's legacy. So here... What has happened is, is that that story has been embedded throughout that whole uh, visitor experience to express the family. That is done through messaging. It's done through visual communication. It's also done through interaction. 
The liquid story for Angel's Envy is a premium bourbon that's extra matured and carefully selected types of oak. So how do we bring this story through? Well, within the retail, it was done through using um, bespoke oak cabinets. For the tasting table, it was a, a single oak tree that was cut in half to create an interactive tasting table. Within the bar area, Angel's Envy is central to the communication. So it's about considering the step, all those steps of the journey and how you can tell that story and the, the richness of that story uh, through the, what you have available. Next, you need to consider the step of the, every step of that journey. So you have to ha have a very clear story arc and, and customer journey. Once you have that customer journey uh, spread, uh, set out, you can then decide what you want to create there as engaging either through brand uh, through education and what those consumer touch points are. We look at it as though it's a story of Cinderella. So Cinderella, ugly sisters, having a pretty shit life, not the best of times. She gets invited to the ball, she makes a dress. She goes to the ball, she meets the prince. Fantastic, amazing. Uh, she has to leave. Now it's so good. Prince goes away, she goes back home, back to the ugly sisters. But she knows what it was like with a prince. Prince turns up. Meets her again, they get married, everybody lives happily ever after. It's an emotional roller coaster. When you're thinking about creating an experience, it's not a flat line experience. It's not you take them in, you take them out the other end. It's about creating those um, high points and even sometimes low points to create expectations to be able to sell that story. You then also within that need to define what your visitor center principles are. So are you a distillery with a visitor experience or are you a destination experience with a distillery. Two different things, two different ways to look at it. And then within that, what are going to be your center, central principles to that? Are you going to be retail centric? Are you going to be food centric? Are you going to be production centered? Are you going to be wanting to tell a flavor story? Are you want to tell uh, an ingredient story? Are you a brand story? Or are you all of those things? Either way, you have to decide what they are so that you can set very clear aims and objectives to what you want to get as a result um, of those principles. Then you need to identify what your key takeouts um, are. So what will visitors remember about your experience and what emotions will they recall? So does it say what it needs to say about your brand? So lasting memories, you need to create great word of mouth, loyal fans and advocates. How do you get people to post uh, on different um, channels and social media to gain more coverage and traction for the brand. That's an emotional connection. Guinness spend millions and have spent millions over the years on marketing. The biggest connection that they have and the most photographed image that Guinness, Guinness have is the black gate. That black gate symbol is, is a pilgrimage for people at Guinness. So everybody goes there, everybody takes their picture there. It's a black gate with a bit of gold paint on it. And it is the most photographed image that Guinness, Guinness have, and everybody wants to show they've been there. That emotional connection and the simplicity of that, so it's not the complexity of the experience, it's the it's, uh, simplicity of the emotion that you can relate to the brand. And then the thinking about community. How do you create not just a community during the experience, but, uh, but pre and post? Lefroy do... Um, this very, very well. They have their friends of the Lefroy. If you go to, if you're friends of Lefroy and you go to the distillery, you can take a square foot of Isla, claim that, put your flag in it, take your photograph. What that then allows is, well, well there's, there's over, well, there's over one million friends of Lefroy up from 150 com uh, countries, so they, they have a huge community. What that also allows you to do is then connect with that community uh, through different channels. You can talk to them about product releases, you can talk to them about um, special releases, events on a global scale, just not, not just within the confinements of a single market. And then finally, tasting. So alcohol is an experimental uh, product that people want to uh, interact with. Um, they, so Obviously, liquid to lips, we all know, is a very obvious way to do that, but it's also a way that you can take the experience out of where you are within your distillery, within your home, and take it into different marketplaces to be able to talk about the liquid or actually to try and create um, activations or signature serves. So an example there of 
you may have seen it a few years ago, Jameson Ginger and Lime was taken out to all of the bar shows, primarily to teach people how to make the surf, but also to try and create a bar call that was synonymous with to, to, uh, Jack Daniels and Coke. And then finally, pinpoint the reasons why. So, how are you going to tell your story? Uh, and, and truths build a showcase. So, to, and they create to create brand experiences with embodied messaging is a very good way to do that. Um, Aberfeldy, Jimmy's and Aberfeldy have well, 60 to 70 percent of their flavour and 100 percent of their colour comes from the cask. So, to create a focal point of the tour, 1,700 staves were used to create a stave tunnel, and this became the central focal point, and really the, the, the smile moment of that tour is the most Instagrammable moment that they have on the site there, and it's the, the image that you will see consistently um, uh, throughout their Instagram. Then you need to think from that, who are you telling your story to? So we break this down into three areas. We call them paddlers, swimmers, and divers. So your paddler is somebody that it could be a tourist, it could be somebody that has very little knowledge, but you want to deliver to them around three to five key messages to do with the, to do the brand and the product, something that they will leave with and pass on to somebody else. That's also the same with the swimmers and the divers, but with the swimmers, you might give them a little bit more information. Now, that might be done through scripting. It might be done how you explain or create an experience within that. So that might be how do you show maturation over time? How do you show change in color? How do you describe what the angel share is? And then your divers. So your divers are then... They, that can be consumer and that can be trade. And these, these are the geeks. These are the, these are the people that want to know absolutely everything. So here you might consider doing uh, bespoke tours for these people. Or you might start to look to create um, uh, influencer programs that you will run separately to your main tours. So thinking about what your audience is and thinking about the stories that you're going to tell and the tr how you deliver those truths will really encompass and embody the story, um, the the experience that you will uh, create. So to sum that up in very quickly you know, with the time that we've had, it's just some very, very simple golden rules that we apply when we're looking at visitor experience. So you need to understand your audience because without them you have absolutely nobody to sell to. And if you don't know what they want, you won't be able to create that relevant experience. You need to know your brand. And that seems a very obvious statement, but if you don't know that brand, then you can't bring it to life. You need to give them a reason to come. So develop a guest experience that creates a noise and stands apart from your competitors. So you need to understand what's happening with your competitors, not just within the sector, but out the sector as well. Who are your audience actually engaging with and what kind of experiences are they engaging with? You need to entertain and educate your guests. So that goes back to defining your visitor center principles. And remember, it's, it's it's not the size and the complexity of the experience that you, you create, but it's the memory that delivers. So it's not about the amount of money you have to create that experience. It's defining exactly what the memory is we want them to take out. You need to create advocacy in sales. That's, it, that's obvious. That's basically, they go hand in hand. You create advocacy, then sales will come from that. And then finally, you need to stay in touch. Because basically every visitor you have is the future of your brand and is the future of your experience. So I hope that gives you a kind of very quick snapshot of um, the, some of the key principles that you'll look when uh, looking to create an experience and looking to embody that into a sense of place. Thank you. Uh, my name is Tom Mooney. I am founder and CEO of Westward, American Single Malt Whiskey. Uh, and I thought as we approach this topic of the visitor experience and sense of place, well, first I should show you a picture of the place uh, since the American Northwest is one of a kind. Uh, but also, you know, I, I suspect that if we all have closed our eyes and think of distillery visits or uh, visitor experiences, uh, or if we think of some of the examples that have come up already in, in this conversation, we will be talking about brands that have been around for a while uh, who then significantly elevated that visitor experience and that sense of place. So I thought it'd be interesting to bring you a different story 
which is the story of a distillery built from square one uh, who you know, distilled the first drop of something before anybody knew what it was uh, because it's really not not the story of how to give a sense of place to a brand we know, uh, but how to use the place to make the brand known. Uh, and so it's a bit of a reverse paradigm there. Uh, and, uh, and so along the way, I, I also like approaching it this way because I get to tell you things that we actually did uh, and which ones were smart and which ones really didn't work out the way we thought. Uh, or perhaps more importantly, how as our brand has grown up, what that visitor experience needs to deliver and its importance for the brand continues to evolve. Uh, so I plan to be very candid about what we've learned along the way, as those of you who know me would expect. Um, all right, so, so first of all, and before we get into the details, uh, in, you know, in 30 seconds or less, um, the, the tasting room for Westward Whiskey has already, even in you know, the last decade, changed dramatically in terms of its reason for being. Uh, when, when the distillery begins from scratch, uh, the, the first role the tasting room plays is called the only place you can generate revenue. Uh, and it literally pays, generates the money this week to make payroll next week so that we can make more to put in the tasting room. Uh, and the story of most of the 2,000 plus craft distilleries that Margie mentioned is exactly that. It is the first place where hard work can turn into revenue and allow companies to stay in business. Uh, and we were no different. I mean, we, we began distilling whiskey 15 years ago. Uh, we first brought Westward into our tasting room seven years ago, uh, and it remained only in our tasting room for most of the last seven years. Uh, us bringing our whiskey finally into wholesale distribution came much later. Uh, and so for that, those first few years, um, you know, whether it was Westward or other products we made, the tasting room kept us in business. Uh, and because it did, you know, as we thought about you know, how to manage it and what to manage it for, you know, we wanted to bring as many people in to visit because we felt something we were doing was interesting. We, of course, wanted to tell the story of the brand, uh, and it was pretty awesome when they left with a bottle or two because then we could make payroll next week and keep doing what we're doing. Uh, so after we were doing that for a while, uh, we, so we came upon the first revelation to us, which was you know, we might be taking this a little too literally in thinking that the whole point of having our tasting room and of creating that visitor experience is to bring people to a distillery. It's super cool to go to a distillery, but from a broader, longer-term standpoint, you know, there are more important things to do than try to convince as many friends as possible and as many of their friends as possible to come see what a distillery looks like. We realized that we needed to bring the brand to them. Like at some point, you know, we we're not the Walt Disney Company. We're not selling tickets to Disneyland. Right? We're creating a world-class spirit that we need for people to know and try before they'll ever walk into a store and buy a bottle and love it. Uh, and so the, the whole reason for being of how we host visitors changed with that understanding. Uh, and one of the first things that changed as a result was you know, we moved away from the, not away from the distillery, but in addition to being you know, a great distillery visitor experience, we started to look for other places in which we could bring the distillery, bring everything that was great about Westward and what we do, uh, and put it in front of people where they are. Uh, and this is, I mean, an incredibly obvious insight, but one that eluded us for a while, and I think not everybody may have caught on to. Uh, people are busy, and you want to make it easy for them to find you. Uh, and so one of the pivotal moments you know, for us as, as a distillery and, and for Westward as a brand uh, was an opportunity that came up to build a distillery tasting room uh, at Portland International Airport. Uh, and so we became the world's first distillery tasting room at an airport. Um, yes, we were aided enormously by the regulatory framework of Oregon that allowed us to have more than one tasting room, including the one at the airport. But that doesn't matter. Like we could have just as easily not seized that opportunity, 
just as everybody else who could have seized it did not. Uh, and having that tasting room at the airport completely changed the not just the level of exposure consumers have to Westward, but our own idea of what that visitor experience is like. Because all of a sudden, while we continue to design you know, a great experience for somebody who comes to the distillery and spends two or three hours, we needed a really great experience for somebody who's going to catch a flight in 45 minutes and wants to learn about the brand. And you know, from a numbers standpoint, you know, this year we will have received a little over 100,000 visitors when the year is over. More than 90,000 of those are at the airport. So, so when you think of you know, what, what our visitor experience is, we may think it's a distillery visit because that's where we live and work. But for 90% of the people who visit Westward, it's the time they spent with us at Portland International Airport, either on their way to a flight or on their way home you know, from a flight. Uh, and so that obviously caused us to rethink you know, what we're saying and how we're saying it and, and, of course, how much time we have to say it. Uh, and then with that, you know, we, we tried to find new ways to take it further. We started looking for farmers markets where we could again bring, let's say, a mobile version of our story in our tasting room. Uh, and once again, find people who we know would be interested in what we do and how we do it, but to go to them, you know, not, not to keep making them come to us. Um, so I'd say that was certainly one of the insights. Now, another thing we realized along the way, uh, as, as that experience changed and as, as the way we connect with people change is, in more ways than one realizes, uh, we're driven by the metrics that we choose to, to measure our business. And um, as an example, you know, when, when the tasting room for Westward was the thing that kept us in business, clearly the most important metric was profit. Because if there was no profit, there was no payroll, and if there was no payroll, there's nobody making anything. And that's obvious, but you know, it, it is where we began. Uh, all of a sudden, you know, over the years, we started thinking in terms of visitor numbers and transaction numbers, and what's the average ring, and how can we get each transaction to be more valuable. Uh, and then one day, and, and this is very recent, I would say within the last year, we realized like those are all awesome metrics if we were a retailer. Uh, and as we started to explore like our own behavior, we realized like internally, we call our tasting room at the distillery the DRO, which is the distillery retail outlet. And the words we use are retail and the metrics we were using are retail. And again, that'd be awesome if we were a whiskey store and we want to grow up and be a whiskey store. Uh, but it turns out that we're you know, the brand owner of a really great American single malt whiskey and that we were not serving the needs of the brand or planting the seeds for the future of the brand by running you know, as profitable a retail business as we were, uh, that just was not, we were, doing, we were doing the wrong things in the right way. Now, you know, we made some money and covered payroll and made more whiskey, but, but in the long run, that wasn't going to serve our needs. Uh, and so we realized that you know, the, the business we're in in the long run, and if, which matches uh, one of the charts Margie showed at the beginning, you know, as we get bigger, as we you know, are here in Berlin promoting Westward in Europe uh, or in Australia you know, a month ago, uh, all of a sudden the brand is much bigger than just one place. While you know, the soul of the brand is in Oregon and at the distillery, you know, the people who enjoy the brand are everywhere. Uh, so to, to think of that experience as not a transaction, in fact, to never again use that word, uh, but to think of it as the start of a relationship or an opportunity to deepen a relationship. Because the fact is, you know, we make the world's most recognizable form of whiskey, single malt. But very few people in the U.S. until recently have done that. And so a big part of you know, what we want people to take away is, okay, what is single malt and how does it compare to something else? What is westward and how does it fit within single malt and within American whiskey? But most importantly, having covered all that, like how can we stay in touch? Like you're a friend who just came to my home. I have a lot more to tell you. And there's a lot more cool stuff that's coming down the road. 
And unless you and I built a relationship the day you made that first visit, you're going to miss out on it and we're going to miss out on the opportunity to share it with you. Uh, and so we are, I mean, in the process today of completely revamping what we call everything, how we measure everything, uh, but really with the goal of becoming the place where relationships with Westward begin as opposed to the place where transactions for Westward happen. Uh, and then finally, you know, on, on the topic of, you know, what, what keeps people engaged and what will cause somebody to be interested in coming back, uh, I mean, this is the most challenging part of everything I just said. I mean, saying it's easy, creating a reason for people to stay engaged and want to come back is hard. Uh, and so you see in the presentation, you know, a couple of pictures from things that I know have worked well. Uh, one is, you know, something I admire deeply is uh, Stranahan's uh, Snowflake releases. So Stranahan's is uh, also one of the pioneers of American single malt whiskey, and they have an annual release called Snowflake that people lose their minds over and fly in to Denver and stand in line and wait for. Uh, and so it creates a recurring reason for somebody to come back and learn more about the brand and be exposed to a new interesting product. Uh, we you know, internally and you know, more recently, uh, started the Westward Whiskey Club. Uh, and so this was kind of another kind of change in insight. You know, we spent about 10 years feeling really sorry for ourselves because wineries can have wine clubs and do most of their business through the wine clubs. And for reasons I won't belabor, you know, the law doesn't allow us to do what wineries can do. And then one day we realized, like, well, we can feel sad or we can at least take what the law does give us, start there, and then change the law over time. Uh, and so we, we launched something that is analogous to you know, your favorite wineries club um, that initially is pickup only because we're not allowed to ship to addresses outside of Oregon. Uh, within a few weeks, we're going to start shipping to addresses within Oregon. And then over time, we'll change that. Uh, and so this, we feel, will become you know, a really important part of how we stay in touch with people uh, and you know, how that first visit becomes the start of a relationship. Uh, so I will leave it at that so that we can share other stories. I know Guillermo will tell you wonderful stories about Mexico. I've had the privilege of visiting him there, so it's as awesome as he's going to tell you. But for now, I'll say thank you. I'm the general manager for Tequila Los Abuelos, is our corporate name. And um, we're located in the town of Tequila, outside of Guadalajara, about four hours from the coastline. This is our little distillery here. And we're very fortunate because it belonged to my grandfather. So there's a story. Got to have a story. if. If you want somebody to tell it, you have to have a good story. And the excess this year. And um, so there, that's the place. So it's very magical. I have a question for you all. I'm going to stop for a minute. How many of you would would go back to Disneyland now? Well, my son would, because he has two children. <laughs> uh, the rest of you, if you don't have children, how many would go back to Disneyland? You wouldn't? I mean, I would. So, yeah, it's a destination. It's a place that's memorable. It's an experience. But I don't go back. And what we got to get is we got to get these people to come back. We got to get these people to be, we call them repeat offenders. So that's what we try to do. So... We kind of tackled this a little differently. Uh, we have uh, two facilities. We have a. How many of you, by the way, are working with a brand right now? You have your own brand or are working with a brand? That are, okay, good. So this is re is this relevant for you guys? Okay. So we had the same problems that Tom had starting up. Like, hey, we can make some tequila now. Now what the hell do we do with it? You know. It's like, where are you going to sell it? So we went through a lot of trials and changes, and we should have just bought his consulting at the beginning because 
we would have honed this all in a lot faster, I can tell you that. We would have figured out who the swimmers were and the paddlers, and it would have been a lot faster. But on our property, it's a beautiful property, 80 acres, the small distillery there. So I'll tell you a little bit about the story. Beautiful facility, great presentation on the, the distillery. There, there's me on the land when I was a young kid. So I grew up there. I, I, I like, wow, this is like my home. I need to share this. That's what I said to myself. I need to share this. And we were struggling along when we first started. Hadn't bre broke even yet. Tom was all about this. How are you going to make payroll? More money going into the black hole. At any rate, we did start with some tours. I thought, well, if we tour people, people will get to know the brand. But I didn't know all of the good stuff that Jason knows. I just knew we needed to get people to tour it. Because I knew if somebody comes, they're going to like it. They're going to talk about it. And we figure about one person that comes in, they'll talk to 10 people. They'll tell 10 people about their experience. If they like the juice, they'll ten, tell 10 people. Well, so we started with fans coming around. Typical aficionados, people that might like, if you make gin, they might like gin. You know, you call them an aficionado. So we would get the tequila aficionados. And over time, uh, we... Uh, developed the tour as it went along. Uh, maybe we didn't know exactly our strategy of what we needed to give these people, but those aficionados are kind of like the paddlers. You gotta give them five things. You gotta give them a little bit that they can take to other people, and they do. And you know what, they come back. So we struggled with how to develop that, but now it's ended up into a two and a half hour tour over the property. We have three to four tours a day. And remember, we're an hour out of Guadalajara, and nobody's coming from Guadalajara, so I can't really do what Tom's doing. me. And, and, and I could put something in the airport, but, but we're an hour out of town, so I'm getting people coming from the United States that happen to be in Mexico. They know about us, and they're making an appointment, because we only do this by appointment. And what we tell them, well, I'm going to step back. We do have a museum. We have the house of my great-great-grandfather. So we got kind of a step up that a lot of people don't have. And it's already turned into a museum. We get about 10,000 people through there, mostly, mostly tourism from Mexico. But you know what? There's a big problem with that for me. They can't afford our tequila. They're not our, they don't buy anything. They go in, they take the tour, they love it, they met, they know, they know the brand, they've heard of it, they they love the tour. And the problem I have is they I, I don't depend on this for hardly any sales. It sells, but it's 95% of our sell is outside of the country. So we have chores there. You don't have to have an appointment there. Over at the distillery, you have to have an appointment. And what we do over at the distillery, we're showing the stone crushing that we do, hand bottling, tops made. I'll have to show you the bottle because many of you probably haven't seen it. That's a first distillation, but look how small the stills are. So when people walk through, they're like, you really make your stuff here? You're not buying it from somebody? Oh, we make it all here. I was somewhat younger in that picture. That was uh, about 20 years ago. Not 18 years ago, that was. At any rate, we give them a tour over at the distillery. They see the fields of agave. And we cap that off with a tasting in the cave. See the cave? It's an authentic cave. And people are stunned. And a couple, a couple comments we get is we thought you were BSing us because you're marketing materials. But then they come through and they see and they see it's all actual. And uh, they have their doubts about us making the volume that we're making through the stills that we have. And these are the paddlers. You gotta give them enough to be dangerous. 
then we did a tour for some distillery guys and we kind of fell into this and we decided to do what we call an industry tour. And that's been 10 years now. We've had over 4,000 restaurant industry, retail industry people vis visit us. I think it's probably one of the best in the industry. And that's what's really helped us is all the industry people that ca came down. And that was also a, a, a work in progress where we had to fix a lot of things. So imagine getting all these industry people down. It's a three-day trip. And imagine the industry people coming down, and you guys know bartenders, you know bar backs, they all drink. Sometimes they drink too much. So we had to deal with that. We had to deal with making sure they were watered up all the time. They always had food so that they wouldn't get trashed. We added distilleries. We added our friends at Ete Distillery. Eduardo Jr. is right over here. And uh, so it wasn't a tour of just our distillery. It became a tour of Eduardo's distillery, too. And it became a tour of Sergio's distillery. And this was all a process of trial and error. And we found that they liked the tour of more distilleries. So it wasn't just about one distillery. But there was one thing we all have in common. It's all family owned. And they love that, too. So we ended up adding glass blowing. They get to go blow their own bottle. In the end, we found out of these 4,000 people plus that have come down now, we get these kind of comments. Best trip I've ever been on. Thanks for inviting me. They never invite the bartenders. They only invite the managers. I got my passport for this trip. America, by the way, Americans don't travel. And you probably know that. 90% of Americans never leave America. So they go, I got my passport for this. Now I'm going to travel the world. Thank you very much for pushing me to do this. We didn't push them. We just invited them. They pushed themselves. At any rate, those are the kinds of comments we got from them with our industry trip. We do uh, six trips a year. We run about 450 bartenders, servers, We've had three chefs come down, and they love it. They all go back, and you, some of you probably knew our brand already, and that's because somebody told you about it. It's all word of mouth. We don't do any advertising at all. And finally, we put one more trip in. We put an industry work program where qualified individuals can come and do all the jobs in our distillery. And that's an amazing uh, change that we see from people because, uh, well, obviously it's extremely educational, but it's very tough. Everybody leaves very tired and with blisters in their hands. But I think if I can characterize, people leave humbled and appreciative of having to do the work that our workers do. We have 85 employees and how hard it is to do to make tequila the old way make the tequila like it was made 150 years ago. So we created these experiences to, and we're more focused on the industry than on the retail. We have our retail piece with the museum, but we have our industry focus, which we feel helps us a lot more in, in the growth. We're in 26 countries now, and um, So what else are we doing? We're adding lakeside private meals. Uh, two weeks ago, we had a bar owner from uh, Sevilla there with his wife having lunch by the lakeside, a personal chef grilling for him, and they just absolutely loved it. It's an experience they'll remember the rest of their life. Uh, a month ago, a bartender proposed at our lookout point, so something him and his wife will his fiance will remember the rest of their lives. Uh, we're going to rehabilitate the museum to up the quality on the retail side and on the paddler side, as you might say. And we're going to do a little bit more recruiting local hotels. We've never even touched hotels. We've never even taken a brochure for hotels to visit. So there's a lot of things you can do to generate more people to come and 
look, we're 15 years in and nobody's ever taken a, a brochure to a hotel to tell them that we do tours. So those are some of the things that are happening. Our uh, go forward issues for us being a small brand is how do we maintain authenticity, the personality? So Cuervo came to us, Cuervo's our neighbor, very big company, and they have a beautiful train and I love trains. And they wanted to put a train station on our property because we're between them and the railroad tracks. We've got a very good spot. And we fortunately decided without a, the strategy just came by accident. Like I said, I should have hired him. We decided that that train was full of people that really weren't our clients and really couldn't afford it. So we are, we are happy we did not make the mistake of going into partnership with Cuervo for the tourism business. Cuervo does have a big tourism business. They drive in a million people a year into the town. So it's enormous, but it's not our client. It's not the guy that's gonna go and be the repeat offender or the repeat buyer or be in the wine club. So those are some of the issues we have as you get growing and you get more and more people on. How do we maintain the tranquility of that property to maintain the experience? Harry was, Harry's in the back, Harry owns Park Street, he's a great friend, and best service, by the way. How do you maintain that tranquility? So Harry's telling me this morning, man, when you get to your place, the big gates, and you open the gates, and it's like going into uh, this tranquil place, and it's a garden, and it's a, a small, tiny distillery. There's horses, there's sheep there, it's pastoral, and it's like you're out of the world all of a sudden. And you, you've got this sense of a place that you want to come back to. And at any rate, we do this all with uh, four ambassadors helping us out. And uh, it's been a team effort. So, but that's how we do it, uh, what we're doing in the market to uh, have this distillery where where people want to come back. We even make t-shirts that say repeat offender. So for people that visit again and that are industry, they get the repeat offender t-shirt. Anyway, I hope this was useful for you all that can understand uh, how we structured it for our being our based on our location. And thank you very much. Thank you very much. Before we start on the questions, I'd like to uh, actually pose my own question and then I will toss it over to you because I, I was watching the looks on your face and by the way, I didn't tell you, by way of education and training, I'm actually a lawyer and I, I used to do trial work and you used to look at your audience to know your audience and actually much of what was said today, it's kind of the same thing. You gotta know your audience in, Tom mentioned metrics, of course, we heard Jason talk about getting to know who your audience is. But what you didn't say, and I'm going to toss this to each one of you, how do you learn initially about your audience? Because that's where you started, Jason, with one of your first principles. So if you could each comment on your own methods you use to figure out who it is that you are bringing in, and as you said, Tom, building a relationship with. Uh, I mean, for us, understanding our audience comes directly from from an understanding of who's visiting. Uh, and again, in particular for us, our airport location, because there are millions of people who pass through PDX every year. Some fraction of those self-select to walk into the Westward Whiskey Tasting Room. Uh, by self-selecting to walk in there, they've told us they are the audience. Uh, and so that, I would say that gave us a first level of understanding. Actually starting the Westward Whiskey Club has given us a more profound understanding because now we know things like demographics and we can either confirm or refute the hypotheses that we had about, you know, how, what age range or, or where from, you know, our, our consumers are. So the, the more that we've been able to have these relationships, the better 
we can use them to, to answer questions like who is the broader audience? I think from when I was talking earlier about uh, understanding who that audience is from the, from the, the from your sales and your brand perspective to who's going to actually visit your distillery is going to be could be a completely different audience. So you're talking, uh, Tom, was talking about there about tourism in relation to your primary audience that you're looking for your product. So it's understanding who they both are and then how you can then speak to them within that experience. And that goes back down to what I was talking about where I was talking about the paddlers, swimmers, and divers. You can almost then get a basis of from the experience that you're delivering. Do you need to cater for families do you need to cater for children is that part of your demographic when you then get up to the you then you move on to your divers and you're going into the industry it's a completely different demographic that you're looking at so people with a completely different understanding and education so for us it's it's it's, it's digging digging deep really into uh, statistics so, uh, statistics that we can get supplied um, background information but also understanding what these audiences and other experiences that these audiences are taking out with the sector. Guillermo, for you? Well, I think you got to look at two things. First, you've got your distributor who's a sell point. you got to sell to him, so you got to understand the distributor. And then you can go out and visit the retailer so you understand why the retailer is buying your product. And you got to understand who the retailer is selling to. And you can ask them who buys the product. So you can get an idea from the retailer who's buying the product. They usually know, they usually know their people that are coming in because they're regulars. And the same with the bars and restaurants. You can ask the distributor salesman who buys your product in bars and restaurants. So you can get a, an idea going to the bar and restaurant and figure out who's ordering that kind of product. Uh, what's, what's the general income of the people but we did it by trial and error i mean it's just we did a lot of uh, tastings and charity events we still do and so there you get a lot of talk time so i i suggest you do do that tastings they're a pain in the ass you really you really don't like them because they take a lot of time and you're going to waste your time talking to people but you eventually you eventually figure out your customer profile of what your product looks for and then you find that person so I, I suggest that you do a lot with your product in terms of getting out there and asking questions about it you'll you'll learn where it works and where it doesn't we have truck drivers that buy our product and people would say no it's too expensive for a truck driver but not for a truck driver that's an aficionado nothing's too expensive for him in the tequila because he's a tequila aficionado so Thank you. I do have one more question. And I go back to Tom, I, I, again, a place where re relationships begin probably should resonate with all of us. But we all know that relationships are hard and are tough and, and communication is key. So my question, Jason, for you, if you have any advice, but Guillermo and Tom, how do you train your employees? to deliver and to help build on the relationship because one of the presentations here in this business forum gave these statistics. 30% time spent with a television spot looking at a brand. Two to three minutes in a store with a brand. But as they come into your areas, you've got two to three hours with those folks. Maybe less time at the airport. But clearly, two to three hours is a, a chunk of time. And I suspect that you're not present with everyone coming in. So how do you train your team to build on the relationship that you'd like to develop? I mean, I, I can, so I'll, I'll yeah. give a quick answer, but I'd love to hear your, your broader truth. Um, we, we think of everybody who sees a consumer in one of our tasting rooms uh, as, as what Guillermo would have described as trade. Uh, and just like somebody who visits Guillermo gets you know, an incredible firsthand experience, including actually working the stills and making the product, uh, anybody you ever meet at a Westward tasting room did the same thing and can speak eloquently about it, not because I told them, but because they did it. Uh, and so we, we do try to, to give everybody 
at least as much, if not more, training than you know anybody in the trade who supports our brand. Okay. Jason? I think, yeah, I think from the, the, the training aspect and, and, and taking them through the process and understanding the brand, but um, we look first for personality. Um, you, can, you can take the personality and teach them the facts. You can't do that the other way around. So it's very much having to look and be very specific about whether that person sits, your, sits within the personality of what your brand is. And they, everybody doesn't have to speak with the same voice, but they should have the same tone of what you're trying to put across from the brand's perspective. Um, that's, yeah, that's really the way we, so we, we, we look first personality-based. It has to be personality-based um, because if you're going to keep the attention of somebody for two hours, um, you have to be able to have that, that, um, that interest. Um, but again, it will always look uh, f first poet to call is, is people that actually already work for the business, people from the family, people that actually are really embodied into the brand and can talk freely and with, with so much sort of vigor about, uh, about what they're doing. Yermo, anything they to have add to, on? They have to have, I agree with personality, they have to be marketing, they have to be outward going people first of all. And we give a storyboard. So we, they can use pieces of it um, in a pictorial and they can design their own pretty much within a parameters. Uh, our tour is constructed to to walk through in the same direction. So it's got a, a construct. And then we just have to figure out if it's a paddler, a swimmer, because the swimmers want a little more information or the diver that wants a lot of information on the tour. And we have tour guides and we have ambassadors. And the ambassadors, we all have to figure that out. Even me as an owner, when I'm talking to somebody, I have to figure out, is it, oh, this guy's a, a paddler, so I'm only going to give gloss over. So that's how we do it. But we have a photo book that has the basic, and then we have a like a master presentation that has everything, the whole kitchen sink and the garbage disposal and everything, you know. So that's how we do it. Okay. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Hopefully you were... We're able to take away a couple of nuggets, and when you go back to your own place, you're going to have a better sense yourself of what that experience offers. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all for coming out.